Thank you very much, Roman, and uh, uh, more generally, thank you very much, like to uh, uh, so Beatrice, Hugo, and Slava for the organization, the invitation to talk, and uh, for organization for organizing this uh, celebration of uh, easing and gathering such a uh, huge a number of generation, a big crowd of researchers sharing so many different interests, but the same uh, passion for the model. I take the opportunity to thank particularly Hugo and Michael who just uh, show me how beautiful easing was. I was not very convinced. I thought always percolation is the simplest mathematical model and they managed to show me how really how beautiful this model is and I thank them for that. And maybe more generally, it's uh, quite impressive to be in such a crowd with so many uh, mentors and all the very impressive name behind the uh, inspiring papers uh, to meet in person. So thank you very much for uh, all the work you left us to read. Uh, so today I will discuss about uh, so a joint work with uh, Michael uh, Eisenman, Hugo Duminil, and Simone Varzel. It's about uh, emergent planarity in 2D easing with finite range interaction. So the, the general idea is to extend uh, something that is typical from planar easing model to uh, finite range models or so arbitrary finite range. For this talk, I will stick with slabs, which are just uh, copies of D2 above is order. So then I can just talk about uh, next near neighbor model, but the general idea is that you move from something planar to something which stays two-dimensional, but is no longer planar. We cannot be drawn in the plane. So I will start with the, with the, the result, which is uh, the, the Pfaffian structure of the uh, boundary uh, spin function. So that's my first part, which is about like planarity. Uh, so in this, uh, I will start with just the, the, the graph H, which is uh, Z times N. So it's really like uh, the, the planar Al Spain, a space. Uh, and I will just use a notation. Uh, x tilde y if uh, x and y are neighbors, so if, that, if they are at distance one from each other. And here, in all, in all this talk, I will mostly consider uh, the nearest neighbor uh, easing model. So with uh, the Hamiltonian h of sigma, uh, which is minus beta sum of x neighbor to y, sigma x sigma y at inverse temperature beta. And uh, the object which, are which we are interested in are the boundary spin functions. So, so we have this half spin, and we consider two endpoints at the boundary, which are uh, order. So this, identify it with z, is the boundary of this space, and we consider uh, two endpoints. at the boundary, and uh, the endpoint spin function, sigma x1, sigma x2n, is just the uh, one over z, sum over all sigma, sigma x1, sigma x2n, uh, exponential of minus h of sigma, and there is, yeah, one over z. Okay, that's a uh, the object we are interested in at the uh, inverse temperature beta. And you don't have any boundary condition anywhere? No, so here I have no boundary condition and no, uh, and no external field. So it's really like uh, just a, a planar uh, easing model. I will just stick with two. Sure. 
And the theorem, uh, so I would write it here, which is the, the theorem of a uh, uh, Grandval, Boel, and Castellain. It's an E. Ah, here this one. Yes. Ah, yeah, I don't know how to copy. Sorry. Well, and Castellain. from 78. And this theorem tells us that these uh, uh, boundary spin functions have a Pfaffian structure, which, and that does not depend on the temperature. So for every beta, uh, non-negative, we have sigma x1, sigma x2n, beta, uh, yeah, sigma, sigma x2n, Beta is equal to the Pfaffian of uh, the upper triangular array, so sigma xi, sigma xj, for i smaller than j, and that's like that. So what is remarkable is that like we have this uh, n spin, uh, two n spin function can be written in terms of the two uh, spin uh, uh, function. So the, just to remind the, the Pfaffian, so here just for the sake of notation, the Pfaffian of this RAJ, so if you have an upper triangular array, uh, it's just uh, something which has the same form as the determinant. It's a sum of a pairing. Um, signature of pi and uh, r a pi one pi two and so on a pi uh, two n minus one pi two n. There's the terminal. Maybe two n on the left side. Yeah. There is more equal to two n <laughs> left. Ah, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, two n. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this is just uh, here, uh, a pairing is just a permutation um, where pi of 1 is smaller than pi of 3 and so on, pi of 2n minus 1, and pi of 2i minus 1 is uh, always smaller than pi of 2i. So it's just a, a permutation where you can interpret like you pair the points together. And uh, there is a relation between Pfaffian. Here you can, uh, the Pfaffian of a matrix. So this you can also consider, see this as a uh, anti-symmetric mat matrix by just de defining the lower triangular array by minus aj. And the Pfaffian is related with the determinant by Pfaffian square is equal to the determinant of. OK. So for today, like. Uh, Maybe the, just a few remarks about this, uh, this, uh, this formula, uh, that it's, uh, it's actually very general. So here I, uh, I consider the Alf's place, but uh, it's something that uh, holds in high generality for any planar graph and any planar interactions. It's a kind of weak theorem for free fermions. Exactly. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a weak rule for the free fermions, but uh, yeah, for me these things are quite far from my, uh, so yeah, that's uh, correct. So the fact that the interaction is near as neighbor is important. So here, no, the fact that it's important is the fact that the graph is planar, but uh, the graph of the J, so the underlying graph, but uh, then you, you can take Z2 and draw some, red, some interactions, as long as the underlying the induced graph is planar, it's, it's working. And it does not depend on the temperature. But the sequence of spins, uh, you, you took them all. Uh, yes, yeah, so I didn't uh, precise. They are here. Did you take them free? No, this is, this is a special case of a formula for the Kadnov Cheva fermions. And when you. So this works for the Kadnov, This is true for the Kadnov Cheva fermions anywhere. And if you put them at the boundary, 
then they're related to the spins, but only at the boundary. No, no, and on the boundary, sure, but they don't have the, to but the sequence on the boundary, you can take... Arbitrary sequence. They don't have to be consecutive. They don't have to be consecutive, they are arbitrary here. They are just uh, along this uh, boundary line, like I drew above. It looks like in your picture, oh, looks, okay. there might be spins in between them. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry, I, 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 I wanted to make a picture which was more... Uh, I didn't want to draw on this one, which was too small to say that they cannot be arbitrary far, but I completely failed. Yeah, so, yeah, so uh, <laughs> okay, thanks for the question. So I, I hope it's clear. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so now I will uh, come to the second part. So this part is uh, is uh, is well known. It's uh, it's uh, forty years old, forty four. Uh, the 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 thing that uh, I want to discuss today. Uh, what do I grab there? So now we'll, uh, I will uh, talk about the, as I said, the emergent planarity. And as I said for this presentation, uh, I will talk about slabs. But all what I will say is also working for uh, arbitrary uh, 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 finite range uh, constant on Z2. So here I fix k larger than or equal to 2. And this time I consider the graph uh, slab k, which is a graph uh, Z times n times uh, uh, 1. Okay, so I take k copies of, uh, of the graph before, but one above the other. So I will try to draw something. That looks uh, like that. And here the idea is that this graph is still looking from far two-dimensional, but you don't have this planarity constraint. And the, the, the theorem, so the theorem that we proved, is that nevertheless, uh, we observed, we can observe uh, the planarity emerging. So this is uh, the, the theorem with uh, uh, Michael, Hugo, and Simone, is that, uh, the Pfaffian structure no longer, uh, no longer holds, so it's no longer an equality. This is just wrong. It's, 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 it's not an equality. But still, if you take uh, x1, so this time x1, uh, x2n, so again smaller but arbitrary at the boundary of the slab. So here what I mean by the boundary is like, for example, you can just consider this line. Uh, and you look at the endpoint function, so sigma x1, sigma x2n. And here it's important, I take uh, the critical point. Yes? The axes could go up and down. Uh, on these yeah, for example, they could be up and down, but just for simplicity, just let's consider them all the line. The, 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 the theorem will be, here. but the, the, because anyway, we'll see that the next condition will make this kind of uh, height a bit irrelevant. Uh, so here I take beta c, so I am at the critical point on the slab. Here I consider uh, again, just the next nearest neighbor easy on slab k. Uh, beta c for, for the plane? No, beta c for the slab. So I, I, I am at the critical point in the slab. Uh, so cr critical. Do you want next nearest order? 
Yes, here I just want next to your neighbor. It's just because I, uh, it's just I defined it and I want to work with the same. But you could also think of like the theorem will solve for finite range. The boundary is a narrow boundary. <laughs> the boundary is this one. Yeah. Is this line of the is uh, is uh, is uh, the boundary is this z is z times zero times zero. That's what I call the boundary. Okay, and. The theorem is that then you again have the Pfaffian structure, sigma x i, sigma x j, for but asymptotically. So here, ah, again I forgot this too. Sorry. I think I will maybe repeatedly do this mistake since I already did it twice. <laughs> there will be a third time. Uh, okay. And the, the thing is that uh, this hold up synthetically, what does it mean, this little of one, say, is as the distance between the point goes to infinity. So you, you take the critical easing on this slab, you take your point very far apart at criticality, and then what you see is that you recover this Pfaffian structure. And the, the, so there are like, a, there are, there are like a, a few comments I would like to make. Uh, so here, actually, I insist on beta c, but this Pfaffian structure also holds in the subcritical regime and in the supercritical regime, but for obvious reason. And that's not the phenomenology I want to describe here. It's more like a universality type result at the criticality. The reason why it holds is that in the subcritical regime, everything uh, decays exponentially fast and you just have one dominant term. And in the supercritical regime, everything converges like to the magnetization, to the power, and it's also a trivial computation. So it's really non-trivial result at criticality. So, but away from you still have this. You, st you still have this asymptotic result because this converges to the magnetization to the 2n and this one as well. And then it's just an identity between matrices, which is, but it, it's not something very relevant. The real result is what happened at criticality. And it's the fact that somehow the, the slab k at criticality belongs to the same universality class as easing. In some, in some way, you have this, uh, this, uh, this uh, very, uh, uh, that's but the criticality is on the slab with next to this neighbor interaction. Uh, on the slab, as I as I said, so maybe I should really add it as a comment. I think I, so it holds for slabs. Slab k. For me, it's just because it's a good example of a two-dimensional graph, which is not planar. But you can also take z2 with finite range interaction and arbitrarily finite range. As long as it's finite range, you, uh, all the arguments you will work, and I will try to give the argument, you will see why I don't use really the structure of the slab. Yes? How oh, does uh, beta c depend on k? Yes, I mean, what I say is that you take a graph, uh, so you take, uh, you take an easing model, which is either on a slab, nearest neighbors, or z2 with finite range. You take it at criticality, at beta c, and then you have this Pfaffian structure which emerges. But the question was, oh, in your case of the slab, the slab k, uh, how does beta c depend on k? Uh, oh, how does beta c depends on k? Uh, I don't know, it interpolates between beta c of the plane and, uh, and beta c of the, of the z3. But uh, I don't know the, what the value uh, exact. It will depend on k. Yeah, it's, it's actually a result. Uh, I think I know the argument for percolation, but uh, seeing the same, so it's a result of Eisenman and Jeffrey, but uh, Grimet, yeah. I should either use both for problem, yeah. Can you let k increase with the distance and get something like? Uh... Uh, I guess you can make something quantitative, but it will be very bad. Because we use a gluing thing, so we, have a, we will glue things at exponential cost. So I think you can take k of order log n if the distance is, uh, but I think it's, and actually even, it, no, it, our result the, the, in state, it's not quantitative. So basically, 
I can just say we can take k slowly going to infinity, and you will still get something like that, but uh, the speed will be very, very. And about cost critical? Yeah. Off critical? Like you take beta uh, very close to the critical points, but it goes to beta c as the distance goes to infinity, so that it's not trivial. But yeah, the same, but it's a, it's yeah, it's the same type of a, yeah. Yes. Sorry, just to I had exactly the same question. So in the near critical, is it still true? I mean, the thing is that you have to make a bit things quantitative. You would have a condition on how far you are from the critical value. Well, where, I mean, maybe we should see in the proof where you use beta c, uh, where you use that you're in. Yes, we will see. Maybe, maybe I can answer later. If you have RSW. Yes, but it's not really the real RSW you know. I mean, it's, a, it's a weak version. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's good. I had a lot of questions about the, the results, so I, I think I'm confident everyone got <laughs> the statement in all its uh, detail and a possible extension, uh, even more than uh, I thought. Uh, so uh, now I will try to, to give a, an idea of the proof and for the, for the, of, the, of the argument, and I think I would come back to a, to a, to a remark of a, the talk of, a, of a Michael yesterday which is how beautiful uh, it is to make model work together and to import ideas from one model to another. And the, 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 the kind of uh, strategy, uh, so if you have easing, and I will just uh, do the same picture as Michael yesterday, except I do it vertically. And to say that oh, it's, it's very nice to see all these uh, type of uh, model work together. And here, uh, the thing that uh, we want to understand is this Fafian structure on the, on, uh, so here I, uh, I really mean in the planar case. So I have the Fafian structure. And, uh, I would like to extend this, let's say, to slab k, finite range. And this is what you would like to understand. And the thing is, the, 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 the way here, it's not completely obvious is how this, how the slab, like uh, the planar proof is really sensitive to planarity. And you don't really see because it's, it's really an exact, when you have a computation, you have something exact. It's kind of difficult to see how to make the computation work as soon as you look this exact relation. So the key idea is to give a percolation interpretation, so to see this Fafian structure and to reinterpret that as intersection of path. So somehow uh, some, some path must intersect. So I, I will explain what I mean by that. And the way we, we do that, uh, that's uh, through the random current representation, is to kind of give a random current interpretation of this Fafian structure and to interpret this Fafian structure as a topological constraint of, of planar path with much intersect. We know that in the plane, path must intersect. If you have a square crossing, a path from left to right must intersect of path from top to bottom. And this idea is very much more robust because somehow what, when you are on slabs or you are on, on a quasi-planar, path no longer necessarily inter intersect, but they will come close and they will intersect with high probability somehow. They will come close and they will pass above each other many times, so they will have a high chance to intersect. So the idea is to say, okay, this idea uh, of path intersect, in terms of percolation, it's actually very natural to extend this idea from the plane to the slab. And here, the idea is that, OK, path do not necessarily intersect, but they intersect with high probability. And that's where this little o of 1 come from. Somehow, the thing is that if I take two paths in the, in the slab, they, they can avoid each other, of course, they, they can jump above each other, 
But the idea is that this has a low probability that they pass above each other without intersecting it. But then once you have that, you can reuse this correspondence. And there you get your asymptotic Fafian structure. So emergent Fafian. So do you mean that actually the, this high probability goes to one as points become part of it? Exactly. If you take long path, let's say you take a big square, and you have a path from left to right and a path from top to bottom in the random current, the paths may avoid each other because you are no longer planar, but they will intersect with high probability, and that will be enough to deduce that this relation uh, holds. So somehow that's this nice back and forth. That uh, in, It's a nice example of a back and forth. And here the, 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 the tool, which is a tool which is very natural in, a, in the percolation, the kind of tool we use is this rousseau semo welsh uh, result that was mentioned already was, uh, by, uh, by Johan. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a tool that we use to show that they are intersect with high probability. OK? Other questions? It's a general strategy. No, maybe I will. I uh, don't know how much I will uh, have the time to. Ah, oh, kill that time. OK. So the, 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 so my third part, uh, as I said, I would like to explain this correspondence in the plane. So here, uh, first, in order to explain, I need to uh, discuss a little bit of the random current. Uh, so I don't want to make a full definition. So this random current, I think they appeared first with, uh, by, uh, in the work of uh, Griffiths. Earth and Sherman, where they proved this uh, GHS inequality uh, in the 70s. And it was uh, later used a lot uh, and reused. I think the name was coined by Michael Eisenman uh, in uh, 82, where he used a random current to study uh, the relationship uh, like the, uh, yeah, for deeper analysis of the, of the, of the, and actually for similar thing, but in high dimension. Uh, and later, actually, they have been used in many places, uh, even recently in the, to understand continuous phase transition in dimension three. Okay, so the, the, here I just want to do a very brief introduction of what we need about them. So here I just take a general finite graph. So G equal V, it's a finite graph. So I leave a bit my uh, framework. I just go on a finite graph. Uh, I will take a simple example. Say very, so it's planar, but I, here it's just to, to introduce the random current. I don't uh, care even about planarity. Um, it's planar because I want to draw it on a board. Um, so a current is just a, a function that gives every edge an integer number. So here on this graph, I will take an example of a current. So it's 0, 1, 1, uh, I think I want 1, 2, 3, 1, 1, 1. That's a current. Uh, what is important about current is that we care about the parity at a point. So in particular, let's say uh, I can take a point and I look at the sum of all the adjacent current. And I want to ask you whether it's odd or even. So for example, for this point, 1 plus 3 uh, plus 2 is 6, so it's even. And for uh, this point, it's odd. And we are particularly interested in the places where the, this is odd. So the, we consider the set of sources. 
which is uh, the set of x such that the sum of the adjacent edges is odd. So on my example, I have, uh, uh, hopefully didn't make it wrong, I have two sources, which are this point and this point. And the other point, you can check that the, 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 the current, the, they are not sources, at the sum to even point. Okay? And as I said, we want to give, to, we are interested in the, on the percolation type question, so I will use a notation is that we say that two points x and y are connected in N if there is a path um, in, uh, from x to y along which the current are positive. So for example, here uh, I have a path from this point to this point, or I have a path from this point to this point. I mean, I, here everything is connected in this example. But the key remark I want to make is that if we have a current with two sources, so for example, in this case, I have two sources, A and B, there is a, a very nice combinatorial fact that forces these two points to be connected. So it's some very local constraint that forces the existence of a path from A to B. And this is, can be seen very easily algorithmically. I say, okay, this point has an odd number of neighbors, so I can remove one edge. I get a new, a new point which is odd, and this one becomes even, and I will end up at, other, at the other source. So it's, it's a very natural fact, and here we can check on this example that uh, from A to B I have a path where the current is positive. Okay, I think that's all I will use about, uh, about current. Just uh, something that has been mentioned already uh, uh, yesterday is that it's very convenient to decompose this current. I don't understand this at all. The, the, you, you can take just negative numbers, so there are no connections at all, but you still have sources. Uh, no, here the numbers are positive. They are not negative. A current is with a takes value in n. Oh, no, no, thank you. They're positive. Okay, they're natural numbers. They're natural numbers, yes. So they cannot, uh, yeah. so the, your case cannot have, like, uh, you, you cannot have a negative uh, uh, weights. Oh, okay. So yeah, this is just to exclude the zero in the connection. Uh, no, this is not if and only if. For example, here these two are connected, but they don't, are not sources. It's really an implication. Yes. Other questions? Okay, so let me just uh, mention something uh, very, uh, uh, which will be important at least to convey an intuition of the proof, is that when you have a current, you can decompose it into uh, a path and a set of loop. So I will just take, uh, so it's path loop decomposition that's an important idea of current. And I will not give the general, uh, a general statement, but I just want to do this on this example. So we have here, uh, we have our, our nice uh, small graph with uh, our two sources. Here, one, two, three, one, one, one. And there are many ways to do this, but the thing is that we can always decompose this current into first. So as I said, since you, when you have two sources, you must have a path. So I can, for example, select one path. And here when I draw a, a path, I just mean like the, the I just, uh, let's say I have one, one, one all along the way. And then I want to add some loops to recover the whole current. So basically, this uh, this question, this this algorithm, I said that uh, you you can find a path from one to you can then repeat from every point as long as you have current. 
And then what you will do is that you will not end up to a source, but you will close a loop. So you just do algorithmically, you can find, you can decompose a current always into a path plus some loops. Which may be double digits. Uh, yes, so for example, this, I mean, in this case, I uh, chose an example where they are not happening, but a uh, loop like that are possible. So for example, where here there are many ways to decompose this in a path. I could take this path, this double edge, this double edge, and also this loop. I just, there is not a unique way of doing it, but the idea is that you have some kind of a path plus somehow a sec uh, like a super loop, <laughs> like we have seen uh, and in a, in a, like like uh, like uh, like in Michael um, uh, talk and also the the dinner of his daughter. Uh, so you have this uh, this uh, top of loop behind plus the path. Yes. To read your key remark, um, are uh, I read that A and B are the only sources? Yes, it's correct. It's correct because if you have four sources, you may have different ways to connect them, and you may have two sources. Like it's exactly in the, as in the talk of, uh, of uh, Stas yesterday, when you have like four points at the boundary, of, you can connect them like that or like that. That correspond actually to exactly the same combinatorial fact. Okay. So I will try to use these colors uh, in blue, uh, uh, the loops, and in, in red, the, the, the path. And now here there is nothing uh, random. So there is a, I just define a bit the C, which was the current. The random current, so I need to give the, the, the math, the probability of, of it. So uh, if I take a random current with sources at A, so I fix a set A of vertices, and then I want to sample a random current, so I take a random current with these sources, and the way you do this is you do this by the choosing it. The probability of a certain current is, uh, so you have to have the indicator that the sources are A times the product of all the edges um, in E, beta to the NE divided by NE factorial. And since we want to have a probability measure, there is a, just a partition function. But you chose your current according to this weight. OK? Uh, in probabilistic term, it's just like you have a Poisson, independent Poisson random variable with parameter beta on every edge, and you condition to this par parity event. OK. That's all I want to say about, uh, about current. And now let's go to the, to the, so I think I erased my uh, diagram. Or did I not? Ah, oh, I have to become a master of the Bible. Ah, like that. Voila. OK, so that's, uh, I want to explain this first uh, arrow in the, in the planar case. So that's my uh, four. Planar proof. And I will uh, just take four points. So this time I try not to do the mistake. I take n equal two. So this correspond to four points. Uh, and the graph here is really, I go to the planar case, is uh, h, which is uh, z times n. And the formula, I mean, the, there is a formula which is a, 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 
In this case, if you look at the sigma x1, sigma x4, minus the Pfaffian uh, sigma xi, sigma xj for one smaller. Ah, I don't have a chance to do a mistake this time because I write four, not two n. So if you take uh, our object, this difference, it has a current interpretation. It is the probability. So I think this identity appeared first in the work of Michael in uh, 82. It's a probability that um, uh, x1 is not connected to x2 in m plus n, where m and n, m is a current, so is a random current Uh, I think I forgot one thing. Here there is a 2 times uh, sigma x1, sigma x3, sigma x2, sigma x4. Times m is a random current with source, with sources uh, x1, x3, and n is a random current which is independent of n with sources x2, x4. OK, so this is an identity and this is not depending on planarity. It's something very general about this. Uh, it's just a, it's a consequence of a switching lemma, which is a combinatorial property of the current. But it does not depend on planarity. It's an identity which holds on any graph. Yes? I'm sorry, I'm confused because your, your, your graph is z, z cross n. It is planar. Yes, my graph is planar. Therefore, the right-hand side is 0. Yeah, so you just proved the theorem. <laughs> it's a proof. <laughs> Indeed. You see, and as, uh, as uh, Rick mentioned, that's why I was not bothering too much with this constant, is that in this case, uh, so with the commands we made, if I draw, let's say, the first current, so I have uh, the first current has the first current m, if I draw m, has a path. It has sources at x1 at x3. So the first current must have a path like that. That's a path where m is positive. And the second one has a path from x1 to x4. And as Rick said, they cannot avoid each other when the graph is planar. Just simply, this quantity is 0. So that's that the, that the proof and that, the, that, that somehow the, the, that was not the original proof of, uh, of uh, Convel, Buell, and Castellite. That's a new proof using the random current interpretation. But this has an advantage to be a percolation type problem. It's exactly these things I was mentioning. I want to give an interpretation of the Pfaffian structure into a condition on intersecting path. And now somehow the, 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 the thing that we want to do is just to, to show that when you are moving to finite range, this picture has a very low probability with the path avoiding. OK? So let me maybe just uh, make a comment. So here I just did, yes? So this would also permit you to move the points x1 up to x4 a little way from the boundary. Oh, that's a very good point. Actually, we, you could the same, uh, and uh, actually you would be able to do that if you move to distance, let's say, 10. Uh, you would lose equality, but again, you would have an asymptotic result. And if you stay in the plane, I think there you would have more techniques. You would be able to have very nice quantitative in the little or one. But even in the slab, actually, that's why I mentioned I don't, it's not so important how exactly where I are compared to the boundary. I can be also at distance 100. Asymptotically, I will see the same thing. That's a very good point. Other, other remarks or questions? OK, just something here. I gave the representation for four points. 
uh, when you have endpoints, basically the, the, you have similar identities, they're a little bit more complex, but the thing is that you just want to show like if you have endpoints, so yeah, maybe, so that's for four points. Ah, I did the mistake for the third time, <laughs> as I promised. So if you have two endpoints, uh, you want to say that this kind of, this kind of uh, let's say, here I will take six, or oh, let's take even eight. So if I have uh, eight points, you just want to show that this kind of picture, let's say, these two are connected, these two are connected, and maybe these four are all connected together. This is a possible picture. But for example, uh, uh, such picture, if you would have like this one connected to this one, but this one connected to this one without being connected together, this one, you want to say that this kind of picture is not possible in the plane. And basically, just this kind of observation will bring the full planar structure for two endpoints. So that's exactly, uh, I think in two, with four points, you see exactly the kind of uh, condition you are avoiding. And I will just uh, give an idea to, to how this is proved. So I think I have, I have a 10 more minutes. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. So based on your argument, can you claim that uh, this, this result also is also true for finite graph? Uh, so you mean the, this part? Yeah, because you, your problem is that I define things on finite graph and here my graph is infinite. That's your problem or? Uh, is that still true for finite graph? No, the, the first result, the, the planar first. result. Yes. Ah, yeah, the planar result is true for arbitrary planar graph. So the way to formulate it is that you just take, uh, let's say, a disk and you take an arbitrary planar graph with arbitrary coupling constant inside. And then if you take endpoints at the boundary, you will have the Pathian structure. So it's really true for, it's really an identity that will, and here we see why. <laughs> this is, is absolutely, uh, I, I mentioned, I said like, this has absolutely nothing to do with the specific value of beta with a specific uh, coupling constant. It just requires this planarity, the fact that the gra induced graph is planar. Thank you. <coughs> this, this statement on this board doesn't require planarity. And this one does not require planarity. It's an identity which has to do with the current themselves. Yeah, so it works for any, any. Work for any graph, yes. Okay, so I will give a, no, where are we? we? I think I explained this double arrow. I want to give the, this part, which is about the fact that paths intersect. And for that, I will just give the key, what, what was the key theorem we had to prove to show that. So five. Uh, a Rousseau semo welsh result. So, I mean, I think for those who know uh, uh, percolation, this uh, Rousseau semo welsh theory is uh, uh, something very classical in the, in, in, planar, uh, in the study of planar percolation. I will give the statement that we prove here. So now I move to the graph, which is just a square lattice, a full square lattice, anyway, because it's natural, the thing that we want to prove the fact that path intersects is something that happened in the bulk. So we need now a result that happened in the full lattice. So we take Z2 and I consider N. So, and I consider N to be a, a random current which is sourceless. So the thing is that I have no sources. Everything is even at every time. So it's just a, a soup of loop. Uh, and the theorem says the following. So the theorem we were able to prove, um, you say, I will just do a picture. So if you take beta equal beta C, uh, the beta is, a, it, you remember this, this I sample according to the law P, so this will be P empty. And the, in the definition of P there is beta, so I take the critical value. P beta C, so for this, uh, for this sourceless current, 
I have my origin. And the theorem says that surrounding the origin, I have infinitely many loops surrounding the origin. This occurs with probability 1. So I don't tell you at which scale, but in this loop soup, I can find, uh, basically, I can find infinitely many loops where the current is positive and that, con that have the origin in the interior and they are all disjoint. So it's really uh, this rousset seidel type statement, uh, which is typical from, uh, from planar percolation, where you have infinitely many primal and dual loops surrounding the origin. And here we prove this statement for a sourceless current. It's clear that, yeah? Uh, could you indicate uh, a bit more precisely, do you have any control on this? No, that's exactly what I said. It's a very weak rousset seidel welsh We have no control on the, where they are. They actually, it's a very, uh, the, what, what we show is that actually you have a loop with constant probability and then we extend it using some kind of zero one law to, to but, but, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not, uh, we cannot say for example that there is one loop at every scale. That, that is what we would expect. You have a positive chance to have a loop at every scale if you really expect this Rousset Seymour Welsh and I think that's what uh, Mano was uh, expecting also is, a, is, a, is a, and here we just have this Qualitative, non-quantitative statement. Why you call this Rousseau-Seymour-Welsh? So why we call this Rousseau-Seymour-Welsh is that because this is really a standard consequence of the Rousseau-Seymour-Welsh theorem that states that you have crossing in long rectangle with positive probability that says also at every scale you have positive chance of a new, of a new list. It's and a corollary of Rousseau. Exactly. It's a corollary of Rousseau-Seymour-Welsh. And the technique we use to prove that are also using Rousseau-Seymour-Welsh technique. We glue paths together. And, uh, and things, so that's really, the, the, the statement is a standard corollary of rousseau semmerwell theorem, and the technique we use actually are based on res, like progress, we, on recent progress uh, of, uh, on the, we could extend recently this rousseau semmerwell theory, which was a planar tool to slabs, uh, recently with uh, Hugo Dumil, Copin, and Vlada Suralisus. So this, at criticality. So we could prove that also for percolation on slab, and this technique were useful to do that for current. Actually, the, the, there is a, a comment that we not really worked with current. We work with the 14 calcellane percolation because we need, for the same way, it's much more convenient to have FKG. And then we extract the result from, from FK percolation to current. It's just a yeah, side comment. OK. But that's a, that, let's say like that's a, the, the, the result. Technical question? Yes. So if you extract it from FK, does that mean you get it for single current or you, do you need the double current? No, here it's for a single current. I mean, the, the, the statement is for a single current. Actually, we even get it for the high temperature expansion, which is a sub, which can be seen as a subset of the current itself. So, we, yeah. OK. Uh, so now, like uh, my last section. So we did this. We are here. Uh, I mean, we have the rousseau seymour welsh and now I will explain this last piece, is how we use that uh, uh, to, to conclude. So, I think with all the pictures on the, on the board, some of you has already the right figure in mind. So now we, we go back to, uh, so we have six. So this is uh, the, the slab proof. So now I'm back on slab, so I, I, I consider slab k. That's my graph. So, so I have this, this slab with x1, x2, x3 x4 that are very far from each other. And I, I will just, uh, for the picture, that's my, my slab, I will draw the picture with a, with a view from above. So I do planar picture, but it's a slab. So now the, if I, uh, if I, if I, uh, I remember my class from engineer, where we, this view, so this is now the view. I have 
four points, x1, x2, x3, x4. And here you have many points. Huh? That's this part. I take a minimum xc, xj for i different from j, which is large. And the idea is that you, you remember the picture we have is that we have two currents. So we have m with sources uh, at uh, x1, x3, and n with sources x2, x4. And so let me draw first uh, uh, m. So what m has this path decomposition. So you have a path from x1 to x3 plus a superb loop, and the same for n. But now maybe we are on a slab, maybe they avoid each other, these two uh, paths. So this, we cannot uh, say nothing for just this first red path. That's, that's what we have. And that the, the, the picture, so there were a first idea actually, which was to use that this path are fractal and they still have a chance to, to, to hit each other. But that's not really what we use technically. What we use is that we use this loop soup to glue them. And now the idea is that now we have this rousseau semo well so what you need to show is that you have this point z. So you can find a point z where these things uh, um, intersect each other in, pro in projection. So what you can show is that z is far from the boundary of the slab. So that's something we have to show to say that now we are in the bulk. And in the bulk, we can show uh, this additional loop so look a bit like a sourceless current. So the idea is that in this, in the, in the loop soup, I have many circuits. And now each time I have a circuit, these things go close to each other and they have a positive chance. Each circuit has a positive chance to glue the path. And each time I draw one circuit, it, they go at distance k from the path. And each time I have a circuit, I may at some point find a circuit that will do the gluing. That's the, the general, uh, that's the general idea. Of course, there are like several technicalities to make really this statement completely rigorous, but uh, but somehow that's the philosophy of the of the proof. Well, you, you use this file not for the plane but for the several planes, right? Are you? Uh, you use this file you have this Russo Silver well. Yes. But that was planar. Uh, this one. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, here I, uh, it's a very good point. So here it's not z2. Here it was really in z2 times k. Very good point. Okay. And the critical temperature also. Then. And here the trivial temperature is important because of course that this doesn't hold uh, in the subcritical regime. So here we use uh, the critical temperature to prove that. At criticality, you may not have a, a first order phase transition. You don't expect to have a first order phase transition, but uh, you still have path at every scale. So this is really a critical picture. Mm -hmm. But this is also view from above, right? This is view from above. Yeah. Exactly. You have a, a natural uh, notion of a circuit surrounding the origin also in the slab. You just define them in projection. So I don't know if I missed it, but how do you guarantee there's, uh, there's this avoided intersection in the uh, This one. Yeah. So know it's sufficiently far? the fact that this is far. Yeah. Ah, this is something I said. We have to prove it. Oh, okay. Actually, we you the the thing is that you you have to exp to show that the picture when the f this point has to be very close when you don't find it creates some kind of arm event close to the boundary which you have to get rid of it uh, using some other technique. So it's a work. It's something that has to be done. You have to say that you can prove this Z is in the bulk and then... To you also use random uh, cluster to get rid of this event? Or uh, yes, I think so. Yes, I think I, I remember it. Uh, if I remember correctly, for to get rid of that... Uh, there were some combinatorial facts because we were really also using some tricks about the parity to gain some independence. So, we were really juggling a lot between random cluster and random current using the combinatorial property of random current and FKG of, F of FK model. Okay.
Okay, so yes. thank you for it. Thank you very much. So, and there were some questions already, but still, if there are <coughs> more, yes. okay. Uh, so, maybe it's not a question, but a remark, comment, or something. I was trying to think about it during the, the talk. I'm sure about that. Pretty certain that the proof there it yeah. should work as beta tends to be beta c, no matter how slowly, because essentially at the point of intersection, locally, you're going to look. Uh, you're going to look critical, so you're going to have a few circuits to glue. Ah, yes, just because the correlation legs go to infinity. Exactly. And then closely you see the, yeah. But ah. it will not hold outside beta c. Because the two <laughs> quantities do go to zero, but they don't go to zero. They, they have a proportionality constant that doesn't go to one. I mean, it depends what you mean by doesn't hold a, a way of beta. Just the constant doesn't go to one. Uh, I mean, if you fix beta different from beta c, it's also old. I don't think so. Because, uh, yes, it's, a, it's just because these things converges to a constant in the supercritical regime and they decay exponentially fast. But two but things that decay exponentially fast don't need to have this. No, but the order, the first order is the same. Well, the idea is that in subcritical, these paths are going to be glued to the... Yes. So they are going to overlap a lot. Exactly. Exactly. It's a different, uh, yeah. The, this argument will not work, but uh, but uh, but the, 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 this statement is correct. It just it's just not super interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Right. Seems to me, yeah. Seems to me this argument will show, similar argument will show that the the branch and the spinning tree in a slab will converge to the SLE two as well. I mean, did you? Yeah, that's a very good point. It's something I actually I was discussing with Hugo in the in the preparation of a, of this talk, is that somehow we this there are percolation uh, the percolation quantity, especially if you think in terms of schramm smirnov topology, uh, the the the, condi the condition on path on on the on the they should not depend on the finite range because as soon as you have a rousseau semo welsh result, basically the the way things intersect. And the, the schramm of topology should be universal in the sense. So this is a correct point. There is just a small subtlety, and that's also something uh, is that um, as long as you stay second order, <laughs> because for example, if you think of Q equal three Potts model, which corresponds to FK Q equal two, as long as you are second order, you are, should be universal, and as soon as you stay first order, you should go to somewhere else. And here, there is something I didn't, I, it was my last conjecture, I didn't have the time to say, but actually we didn't prove it's second order. So basically this, uh, we proved it, we proved this rousseau semo welsh result in two cases. Either it's continuous or it's discontinuous. Of course, we expect it to be second order, but uh, if it's first order, it's just a trivial statement. So somehow we miss one point, and it's an interesting problem, is to show actually that the phase transition on the slab is second order. But that's a very good point. I think it's correct that uh, as soon as you have a percolation interpretation and this SLE, they should also have the same universality class for finite range. Yes. So do you, do you know the two-point function is universal uh, on the boundary? Uh, so this, I think Hugo is more, uh, can, but that's thing that's correct. This Pafian structure should also imply the, the two-point. Uh, so that's a one over R, one over, one over R squared. Exactly, you're the same exponent as in the plane. Does that follow from what you... Uh, so, so I think, I mean, I don't know, maybe Hugo, you want to jump on the question? With Michael, we had an argument that this Pafian relation allows you to relate the exponent for spin-spin on the boundary to the exponent for energy on the boundary. And the exponent for energy, energy on the boundary is much <coughs> more robust. It's always two, whatever the model, basically. So you get the one half out of the two and the Fafian relation. In order to truly prove that, you need a little bit more than this very weak form of rousseau semo welsh that we are proving. So probably you will need to prove that it's a continuous phase transition, prove that you have kind of a qualitative understanding of what is happening, like crossing probabilities and so on. And then you will indeed get the two, I mean the one half out of the two. So it, it seems a very reasonable problem, but there are a few steps before that, uh, like continuity, that we need to, to achieve. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm afraid our time is over. Let's see.